Mike, how are you? I'm well, thank you. What do you guys have in Christian Kirksey, and how much more comfortable signing him were you uh, despite his recent injury history because of, of the time you guys spent together in Cleveland? Yeah, we're uh, very excited about the signing. Uh, just going through the medical part of it and talking to our people, they didn't think it was anything that was that was uh, long term. I mean, he's never been a guy that's that's been injury prone. So and obviously that's a concern when you see the amount of time that he's missed. But uh, overall, I just think it was a it was a great signing for us for for a lot of reasons. I mean, we're not just bringing a, a really good player into the room. I mean, this is a guy that's got great leadership ability. Uh, he already has a ha, has a head start on on learning the system with uh, with uh, him being drafted, obviously, when I w when I was in Cleveland. So uh, certainly it's a it's a risk when you look at it. Uh, but certainly it was it was a risk that we were more than will, uh, more than willing to take. So, like I said, we're we're excited about it. Wes Hodquitz, go ahead. Hey, Mike, uh, when you look at Rashawn Gary, what do you want to see out of him in year two? And what kind of opportunities do you believe there are in this defense for him, especially now with, with Kyler moving on? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking forward to, uh, to Rashawn making, uh, making a big jump. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a shame that he didn't have this, um, this in-person offseason. Uh, I think that, that, would have, that would have helped him. But uh, no, we're, from, from what we hear and the, the feedback that we've gotten from him and the people that he's, he's been with, that he's, he's having a really good uh, offseason given, given the uh, circumstances. So uh, he, he needs to take a big jump. And when, we, when you go back and look at last year's tape, I mean, he did some really good things for us the time that he was in there. Uh, now, Kyler, Kyler played a lot too and, and did some good things for us, especially from a drop standpoint. Uh, and those jobs are going to have to be absorbed within that room. But, uh, but I do see uh, Rashawn taking a, a significantly uh, increased role uh, I, I do think at times where maybe Preston and, and Z probably play a, maybe a little too much that we want to take some off their plate. So I, I do know that Rashawn is, is certainly built uh, to, uh, to handle, giving us that, um, giving those guys a break. Um, and I, and I, I just think because of his skill set that we can use him more like we've used Z uh, on, on third down, especially that he can kick down inside and, and rush, from, rush from a tackle spot as opposed to always being on the uh, – on the edge. Mark Daniels, go ahead. Hey, Mike, uh, good to see you. Um, if we can just go back, can you kind of just explain how you guys came to grips with what happened with the run defense in San Francisco in the NFC title game? Yeah, it was, uh, be, I mean, I, I can't use any other phrase other than beyond disappointing. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to realize that we played our worst game at the, at the worst time, but at, at, at the same, at the same point, uh, we own it. We're, we're not running away from it. I mean, we went through it in detail with the, with the staff. We've talked to the players about it. Uh, and there's, there's no excuses being offered. I mean, we just weren't good enough in, in every aspect that whether it was scheme, effort, energy, technique. Uh, and the key thing is, is to learn from it so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, and, and I give them credit, I mean, for what they've built there and for what they were able to do. I mean, they've proven themselves to be uh, the, the elite of the, uh, of the conference and, and to beat them. I mean, we got to be on point with everything I just mentioned, scheme, effort, energy, technique. So, um, no, it was, it was a, a tough pill to swallow. I mean, you're always remembered by your last performance. Uh, and and I, I hate for it to, to tarnish what, uh, what we're able to accomplish during the year, winning 14 games. I mean, we're, we're not going to let it do that and, and be this dark cloud hanging over us. But at the same time, uh, it's something that, that, that we need. We're not going to sweep under the carpet. We need to address it. Uh, and we'll do it again when the, when the players are in town and, we're, and, and it's face-to-face. -face. But uh, it's, it's certainly been a focal point. Uh, we're, not, we're not dwelling on it, but it's something that, that we, we know that if we want to take the next step, and we were a game away, but if we, but we, and that's a big step, but, and they, they present a big hurdle. And if we want to take it, that um, there's a lot we have to get done between now and then. Ryan Wood, go ahead. Mike, uh, sticking with the run defense, Matt was asked about it last week, and he said the same thing that we heard a lot during the season, which was it was about gap integrity. I I'm curious, uh, how do you teach gap integrity to, to make sure that players stay with their assignments and in their lanes? And 
have you identified, since it's not a new issue, any, any changes that, that need to be made and how that's taught going forward? Yeah, I mean, we, t we teach it, we teach it the same way. I mean, we're, uh, uh, we talk about gap control and other certain defenses that you're in where you're, you're essentially a gap short. If you're going to play, people use the phrase uh, you know, split safety or a loaded box. I mean, when you're in split safety defenses, when, when you don't have the luxury of having a safety down, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be short and have to have to be able to account for it. Um, so but one of the things we're not going to do is, is teach our guys, Hey, this is your gap. You absolutely 100% need, need to need to stay in it because we talk about up front D linemen, especially we want to get knocked back. We don't want to play lateral to line of scrimmage. We want to be aggressive up front. So we, we want to knock our, if I'm, a, if I'm lined up outside shade of a guard and I knock him two yards back into the backfield, but my helmet ends up uh, in, in the a gap. Um, so be it. That's a win. I mean, you're out of your gap, but we've that distance that we've created with the knockback now gives the linebackers a chance to overlap it. And that's a, that's a concept that takes sometimes some linebackers a little bit longer to learn. Uh, but it's something that, that we believe in, that we don't want to play lateral, that we, we want to attack up the field. So we, we're big believers in, in our system uh, when, it's, when it's executed correctly, uh, that, that uh, you know, we, can, we can play the run you know, damn well, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in pretty good stretches. There are times where we don't allocate as many resources um, to stop the run, given that, and, and I've talked on this at, at length before, there are certain calls that we're in where we're, we're playing with two deep safeties or we're, or we're playing four deep uh, where, where we are going to be potentially a little bit short, where we, we have to preach to our guys up front that, Hey, listen, we're, we can't trade one for one. I mean, this, this is a, this is a whole, uh, that, that we have to have a gap and a half mentality. So the one thing that, that, um, that we'll continue to stress, and, and I think our, our coaches up front do a really good job of it is, is offenses are good. They're going to, they're going to get a helmet on a helmet. We're going to get blocked. Uh, the key is, is not to stay blocked and, and having that understanding of how to violently release off a block and the timing of it, not to do it too soon, not to do it too late. Those, those are all things that, uh, that some guys just have a natural sense for other, other ones. It, it takes them a, a little bit longer to learn, but um, we, we feel good. Like I said, we feel good about, about what we do, uh, how we teach it. Um, and, and uh, you know, we're, we'll certainly spend a lot of time on it. And what's great is our offense has their, has such a strong commitment to running the football that when we do get to go against them in camp, that, um, that that's going to be a point of emphasis for, for both sides. Dave Schrader, go ahead. Hi, Mike. I was just curious uh, with what you were building with all the free agents brought in last year and how they got comfortable at the end of the year. Uh, how does that then transition into a year that's not going to have probably a whole lot of off-season on-field work? And what types of defenses and units do you think will have the most success in the league this year? What will what will make the difference for teams having success with an abbreviated off-season? Well, I, I think, and, and talking to a lot of a, a lot of uh, fellow coaches around the league, is that I think everybody it's it's kind of a back to basics approach that, that you got to that scale it back and understand. Okay, what's what's our fastball, and let's make sure that that that's you know we we have everything dialed in with that before we start to to do too much. I think the teams are, that try to overdo it schematically or potentially early on uh, could struggle because so much of it is uh, you know developing the muscle memory once once we get to camp, and and we're going to have to do that in our in our basic calls, our core, our day our day one install. So I, I think it just puts so much more emphasis and importance on, on the fundamentals, because I, I don't think we're going to be able to do a lot uh, from a scheme standpoint. And we'll see. I mean, this is a pretty smart group that we have, uh, but we have scaled back the, the spring install. But everything that we would move forward putting in is, is relatable back to a concept that we're, that we're putting in now. Uh, but but I, do, I do think it's critical that, um, that guys come out of this period now. The only thing we can do is, is improve from a coaching standpoint, improve our guys mentally. And, and we want them to have a, a great understanding of, of what we're doing, our core, core concepts. Um, we're also taking this opportunity as well with the, with the extra time, the extra meeting time uh, to, to make sure that, that our guys have a good understanding, which is kind of like football one-on-one, that we can spend more time on the why uh, and just some, just some general football things that sometimes maybe as coaches, we assume that they know that, that we now have to uh, circle back on and, uh, and make sure of it. Ross Uglum, go ahead. 
Hi, Coach. Thanks for the time. Uh, what have your initial conversations been like with uh, Coach Jerry Gray? What does he bring to your staff? And if Tremont Williams, on that note, uh, is not eventually brought back, uh, who do you see it potentially filling some of those snaps? Uh, I'll, I mean, I'll start with Tremont. Uh, I mean, we all know what, what Tremont has meant uh, to the organization. And as you know, our, our history goes beyond here. We were together in Cleveland. Uh, when we went back and looked at last year's tape, I mean, he was highly effective for us. And, and he's just that rare player that continues to play at a high level at a, at a position where you wouldn't expect somebody to play deep into their 30s, one that requires you know, so much of their, of their legs. So, and obviously we think uh, very highly of T, but we also understand you know, the big picture part of it, the business side of it. Um, so at this point, we, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it is up in the air. We don't know how his, his final chapter is going, to be, is going to be written, whether it's going to be here, whether it's going to be with another team, or whether he decides to retire. Um, but just about Tremont, though, this is a man who, who does things the right way and, and, and should be emulated. Um, how he balances his family, his faith, his football are, are, are second to no one. So I think it's clear how, how we feel about him. But like I said, it's, it's all part of that, you know, the business end of it. So uh, like I said, we're, we're, we don't know, um, but I do know that it's, that it's, uh, it's certainly something that's, that's been discussed. Uh, in regards to Jerry, um, you know, as much as we didn't want to lose uh, Jason, you know, it was an opportunity for him to have increased responsibilities in Carolina. Um, but Jerry was the first name brought up, um, and I had never worked with Jerry directly before, but it was a lot of like one and two degrees of separation, guys that had worked with him and, and, and just raved about him, about his, his work ethic, his demeanor with the players, uh, that, that he can maintain that professional distance, that he, you know, he can give him some tough love, but not at the same time where it's a, where it's a real adversarial relationship. Uh, but he has such a positive reputation as a, um, as a teacher it's just great. It's great to have his, his experience in the room. I mean, his name was the first one to come up. Uh, I happened to be down in Florida at the time when it was all happening and, and found out that he was at the Pro Bowl. Uh, so I drove up and we were able to spend a couple hours together. And, and I knew within minutes that, that he was going to be, that he was the right guy um, for, for the position. So, uh, and so far that's, that's, it's been obvious to everybody that's, that's interacted with him. So it's great for me just having his experience, you know, his coordinator experience, it's also great for me because he's now the oldest guy on the coaching staff too. So I don't, I don't have that, uh, I don't have that title anymore. Uh, but no, he's, he's seen a lot of huddles broken both as, as a player and as a coach. Uh, and, and his, his experience is, is, uh, is welcome. Mike Clemens, go ahead. Hi, Mike. I remember in 2018, uh, Tyler Lancaster kind of jumping off the page in the Rams game and a few opportunities after that. Is there a young player you had in 2019 that uh, started to impress you as the season rolled on? You can hardly wait to get back in action this season. Uh, well, well, I mean, there's a guy right. I mean, sitting in the room next to him is is uh, is Kiki. Uh, that that he had a long way to go as a very raw. I mean, we saw the talent, um, you know, coming out of Texas A&M, but he was just very raw. Uh, had a little bit had a pretty good knack as a pass rusher. Had some natural ability there, but just as far as his run technique pad level and playing with his hands and, and having a good understanding of what, you know, all the information that we gather pre-snap, uh, what is the form, what's the down and distance, what personnel grouping are they in? Uh, what's the formation telling us? Is, the, is it a fullback? Is he tilted one way? Is the tight end off the ball? What are the lines? All, the, all those little details that takes guys sometimes a while to, to, to pick up, not only to, to learn, but then also to be able to apply it. Uh, and, and he was, he was a guy that, that, as the year went on uh, and he got his opportunities in there, he was, he was a uh, productive force. And that's, that's somebody that we're, we're, we're looking forward to, um, you know, to having a, having a much more increased role. Uh, you know, I don't think it was any secret. I mean, we've talked about it that, that felt like Kenny, Kenny played too many plays uh, and that we wanted Tyler. I mean, Tyler's more of a true backup nose and we wanted to get Dean off the field some too. So, so developing some depth in that room, uh, and that means Kiki's going to have to step up. Montrevious is going to have to step up. Uh, we are excited about the the, um, the two guys that we brought in uh, as as free agents. Trayvon uh, Hester and and, uh, and Gerald Willis are guys that both have have done some good things on tape. That, that um, you know, it's a shame that we haven't had them here in the spring to <clears throat> to see it in person. But 
uh, we're looking forward to getting getting those guys um, here in camp. Jason Wilde, go ahead. Hey, Mike, great to see you. Um, you talked a little bit about scaling back or whatever because of the limited meeting time. You know, this is year three for you, but it probably felt like a new year with a lot of the personnel changes last year. So on the flip side, is there an advantage of having so many of those guys back from your core defensively? And then since this is the first time we've talked to you, um, you know, Matt did surprise a lot of us in his postseason press conference by leaving us with the, with the opinion that maybe you weren't coming back for year three. Was that something you and him had to work through a little bit after, uh, after that press conference? Uh, it, it really wasn't because I, I, because I was on the other side of it, I, I kind of knew what, what had happened. Uh, and he and I had just had a very positive conversation when the season ended. Uh, and it was all about moving forward. And it was, it was very um, open and honest. And uh, what, what do we need to do to get better? And, and what were we doing well? And what, what, what steps needed to be, to be taken to, uh, to, to take that jump from, from making it to the championship game to, to, uh, to getting past it? So, as I said, I, I, I didn't see it. I saw it as much ado about nothing. So there was never a moment where I felt I, I, I would be anywhere uh, but in Green Bay. And I know he addressed it at the Combine. Uh, but, but since the meeting that we had even before his interview, that he and I had been full speed ahead. Uh, so it, it's, it really was not something that uh, I know a lot was made of it. Uh, it was an unfortunate thing because I think he was making comments that were more based on the general, uh, just talking about the staff in general evaluation as opposed to, to, uh, to getting specific. So um, you know, there was a little angst with my wife about it, but, but other than that, uh, uh, no, I, I, was, I was fine with it. Um, like, because I said, I, I, already, I already knew, I already had very, he and I had, <clears throat> had already kind of reviewed the season and, and, and talked through the, a lot of the stuff defensively. Um, so, so we were very much on the, uh, on, on the same page. Uh, the first part of your question, it is, it is nice to have those guys back, uh, the, the guys that were year one in the system, because there were so many uh, guys that were a big part of what we did that were in their, that really were in their first year, whether, whether it was Darnell or Adrian or, or the Smiths, and then the, the uh, uh, even you know, uh, Sully taking, taking on a big role and uh, Rashawn. So obviously it was year two, but, it, but uh, as you said, it was, it was very different uh, from the standpoint too of, we also changed our, our skill set. We were able to do some different things with the guys that we added. So we kind of changed the emphasis of, of what we were doing. So there were some calls that we didn't run in 2018 that we ran last year, some concepts and, and vice versa. There were some things that we did in, in, uh, in 2018 that, that, uh, that kind of went on the shelf because of, of who we were in 2019. So uh, that, that is a nice thing about this year going into it, that it, that it is year two for, for virtually um, everybody. Uh, so it's, um, it is nice to be able to kind of pick up where we left off, uh, especially like on, on the back end. I mean, you just look at the two safeties and that, cause that's such a critical position that those guys are kind of the nerve center of the back end <clears throat> and, a, and a Darnell getting through a rookie year and Adrian's first year in a system that just to sit in the meetings with them now and listen to them communicate and just what a better understanding they have. And, and there's, there was no way to get him to this spot other than to play. And uh, you've heard me say it before, there's no substitute for, for, uh, for live reps. So no, it's, it's, uh, it, it is a good feeling to know uh, that given our circumstances that we're not going to have a ton of on the field time, that the, the, the unit that we're going to trot out there on day one is, are, are going to be guys that are, that are all very experienced in the system. Mike Spofford, go ahead. Uh, Mike, thanks for the time. Um, following up at, at safety, you mentioned Darnell. I'm wondering what your um, expectations are for him in year two and what you feel he learned the most just with all the experience he got as a rookie. Yeah, it was unfortunate last year. He had a bit of a slow start coming out of training camp, but I just think he really improved as the season went on, just having an understanding of, of not just what we were doing, but what offenses were trying to do. And I just think the biggest adjustment, not just for him, for, but for most young safeties, is just the speed of the game, the speed at which the processing has to occur, you know, the mental part of it, how, how quickly and accurately the, uh, <clears throat> the information needs to be conveyed, communicated. 
uh, and then just the speed of of receivers and running backs and and uh, you know dealing with 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 that aspect of it. And then uh, you know the, he he made great strides I thought as as the uh, as the year went on. And I, I think the I think the sky's the limit for Darnell. I mean he's he was everything that we saw in him from a physical and a mental standpoint. Uh, and, and obviously had some some rookie uh, some rookie hiccups, but uh, it, this is a guy that that um, we have. He has big expectations of, of himself, and, and uh, those, those match the expectations that we have for him. Jim Mazarski, go ahead. Hey, Mike. Uh, just to follow up uh, on your, your, the Rashawn Gary, Zadarius Smith uh, conversation, I guess, what would, what would have Rashawn benefited most from getting if you guys were together now? You referenced that could have helped him. And then also you said Z can kind of kick down and use that. So are you seeing maybe now that you know them, after a year, like different ways to use them together with Preston uh, in, in certain packages. Sure, that's it's you spend a year with a guy. I mean, you, you get uh, you get a much better sense of of uh, especially because it was the first time having him, how we were going to use use those guys. So, uh, no, Z is a guy, and I think you guys saw it as the year went on. We started to do some things with him uh, that we wanted. To, it, it was kind of a win win because we wanted to take some reps off out of the D line room. And we knew we had some depth in, in the outside backer room. So basically using Z as that kind of walk around defensive lineman. Uh, and, and we look at, when we just look, isolate those calls and, and look at them because we played some different things behind it. But those calls were very efficient for us. They, they were all successful at, at, a, at a very high rate. So, uh, and we know that's something in talking to offensive guys that that, that can cause some problems uh, for them as well. So that's something we'll, we'll, um, we'll certainly continue uh, to look at and have that package evolve because that, that'll allow us to have uh, Rashawn, uh, Z, and Preston all on the field uh, together. Uh, but no, we, Rashawn proved to us that, that he's a guy that could not only rush outside, but he could, he could rush inside. He didn't get that many opportunities to do it uh, during the season, but we certainly think that's a role that, that he could take on. Uh, and I do think he can play more on early downs uh, that he was one of our better guys when we went, went back and just looked at outside backers, you know, setting an edge in the run game that, that just, just how uh, physical and how violent Rashawn was against, uh, against tight ends and, and certain blocking patterns that, that we realized, Hey, we need to, we need to get him on the field more and, and, and take some reps off of Preston. Uh, he probably played more reps than he, he had had before. I know Z certainly because he was essentially a part-time starter in Baltimore had played uh, a lot of reps. So if we can, uh, absorb some of that in, with, with with Rashawn, and then also you know just looking for the the rest of that room to step up. We're excited about a, a Tim Williams uh, that we were able to get him from from Baltimore that 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 has some some pass rush production in in, in his history and did some good things for us down the stretch uh, on the practice field. Uh, and Jonathan Garvin and and some of the other additions to that to that room that we that we feel good about that there'll be some interesting competition for that kind of like, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth spot in, uh, in that room. But uh, this is as deep an outside linebacker room as, as, uh, as I've been a part of in a long time. And, uh, you know, just looking, looking, it's a great problem to have is, is finding ways and to get creative to use them. Bill Huber, go ahead. Hey, Mike, thanks for taking the time today. Um, earlier with the run defense, you mentioned your D-line giving more knockback. Um, other than Kenny, do you think you have the guys capable of doing that consistently against the, the better offensive lines? We do. I, th I think uh, when, when our guys are, are focused in and their, and their initial footwork is good, I think that's important that, that uh, we're, we're all about that first step, that, that uh, we got to have clean footwork. We can't, can't take a false step. But uh, Tyler has certainly put it on tape. We're in the, in the right matchup. Uh, that, that he can, that, that he's certainly capable of it. Dean as well. Uh, and sometimes that's hard for Dean kind of being as tall and as, as long levered as he is a higher center of gravity. But when his technique is right, uh, that, that, uh, that he's certainly shown that he can do it as well. But I, I just think the, the key thing in that room is, is, is beyond those three. I, I think we relied on those three and I already referenced it. We relied on those three too much last year and, and need, need uh, Kiki to step up and need Mon to step up. And I, and I already talked about the, the, you know, the Willis's and the Hester's and the, the, those guys, as far as, you know, having an understanding of, Hey, this is a great opportunity. Uh, and, and we need, it's always, you always have to kind of have fresh legs there and, and, and have a rotation where you can roll guys through. So um, we're look, looking forward to getting those guys out there and, and uh, especially the new guys and seeing what they can do. Rob Domofsky, go ahead. 
Hey, Mike, um, you, you know as well as I do, maybe better, that this is a copycat league. What if somebody watches that 49ers game and says, we're going to run it 40 times against the Packers? Well, first of all, they, 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 the, the 49ers, I think, not to go with the scheme, they had the roster. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big part. We had teams that came in and tried to establish the run against us and, and very quickly uh, had, had to go another direction. So uh, I, I want to say that what, what happened in that game, and, and unfortunately it's because of the, the scope of it and what a big game it was and what a big stage it was, but, but that's, that's not the norm for us. I mean, that, that's, that's the exception, and, that, and that's the, the, t the tough part for us to deal with. Like I said, our, it was our, our worst performance uh, at, at the worst time, but, uh, you know, when, when things are right, that, um, you know, that, that things are, are, are clicking for us and guys have a good understanding of what they're doing, uh, that, we, that we can stop the run as, as, uh, as well as anybody else. So, uh, if that's, if that's what teams want to do, um, yeah, th that's fine. I mean, that's not, not everybody's built to do it that way. Uh, this is, this is a passing league. I, th I think the 49ers showed that they were a little bit of, of an exception doing it, uh, the way that they did it. Uh, I, I just don't, you know, I just don't see that many teams that are that are built to do that, uh, especially from an offensive line standpoint and from a tight end standpoint uh, to, to kind of replicate what uh, what San Fran's been able to do. Steve McGargy, go ahead. Just going back to that run defense, what are reasonable expectations for what y'all can do as a run defense this coming year? And just what gives you confidence you can be better at defending the run? this year than last year when y'all didn't draft anybody on defense till about the fifth round left this last month? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, huge, huge point of emphasis for us. I mean, it's something that we've, we've devoted a lot of time studying to look at, look at what, compare what we're doing and how we're coaching it to other teams. We don't just blindly think like, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to look at anything else. We have all the answers. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that, that, um, you know, every when when we break down our our, our negative plays, we, we look at we, we look at a, a bunch of different factors. We look at was it was this a schematic thing? Was there something scheme wise that's flawed that, that they took advantage of? Was this a technique thing? Uh, did we give up a big play because uh, we executed the wrong technique? It was the bad footwork or or something along those lines? Or, or was it or was it a personnel thing? Was it was it simply their their X was better than our O? Uh, and, and each and each of those answers all have uh, the you know the corresponding responses to it. That hey, if it's a scheme thing, we either fix it or take it out. If it's a technique thing, we make sure that goes on our priority of you know, list of things that we need, we need to practice. Uh, and if it if it's a personnel thing, then then we find a, a way to to get a uh, to to ro you know roll that line up and 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 get the best guys out there that are, that are uh, capable of doing it. So uh, no, we feel good about where we are, just kind of the knowledge that we have, having, having learned from it, coming out of it. Uh, and again, we're not, we're not going to let it be the dark cloud that, that, that hangs over us and, and let that define us. I mean, our, we, have, we have a confident group uh, and they know when, when they execute properly and, and they're playing with the right uh, leverage and energy and focus and the technique and all, and all that stuff. When all that stuff you know, has, to, has to all mesh together, but they know when it's done the right way uh, that, that, uh, that it works and it's effective. So our guys, you know, we need to raise our level of consistency. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're not going to overreact to it because it, it, as I've talked about it before, we're not going to all of a sudden jump into a mode where, Hey, we, we got to stack the line of scrimmage. We got to, we got to, uh, stop teams from running. I mean, the formula of the defense we played last year, we won 14 games, did some really good things. So we're not going to junk our, our approach over, uh, over the over the over the last game uh but we also know that you know we'd be we'd be fools to ignore it as i've as i've already talked about okay we'll we do uh just two more here chancellor johnson hi coach um earlier coach Lafleur talked about uh, how this is a great time for coaches to uh, reevaluate themselves and what ways has the virtual offseason challenged you to develop as a coach i i think it's been uh it's really been the silver lining and then it's a great a great point by by him that that uh when we go back and and like i said we we retrain ourselves and kind of go through each call and break it down because how we're teaching now is is uh and i don't know how much detail he got in in with it because i know offense is very similar to, to to what we're uh to what we're doing is we're we're pushing out uh recorded videos 
uh, both from both myself and from the position coaches about a certain defense. Uh, the players are responsible to watch it, and then they they meet on it. And and we've really limited our meetings to just the positions because it's just it's very inefficient uh, in Zoom. I think it's it's difficult to kind of have the whole unit together, and we really want the guys to focus on just their position. So we'll we'll have a few unit meetings before we finish up, but primarily the interaction we're having is at the position level, and, it, and it's nice for me that they're all staggered that I can that I can jump in. Uh, to those to those different ones that are not uh, basically not occurring at the uh, at the same time. So, uh, and I think our our position coaches have done a really good job of understanding the content uh, and and putting it out there in in a way that uh, you understand that different guys learn different ways and being creative with our methods. But the one thing that that we've been pretty relentless about is is the is the quizzing part of it, the testing on on the content. You know, our guy, we, we track their scores, we post leaderboards. I mean, it's important right now because it's our only way to compete. Uh, but getting back to your question, it's, it's been, uh, it, it's great for us to go back and have to, when you have to go back and record it and basically give a lecture on a, on a certain call uh, that, that sometimes you find out, well, may, maybe I, I got to knock a little bit of rust off this concept and make sure that I'm, that I'm locked in as, as I should be. So uh, that, that has been the, as I've said, the silver lining is, is, the, is the ability for us to kind of bunker in as coaches uh, and, and evaluate our methods uh, and, and what's important, what are we doing that's important and, and maybe, maybe what isn't, uh, what things do we need to emphasize because it's, it's hard now to have a good understanding of, of everything that, we're, that we have to practice. Right now we're just putting in each call and each call has, has equal weight. Uh, but I, I've also uh, am providing the coaches with last year's kind of data as far as what the frequency was with each call. So they have an understanding of when we do start to practice, what do I need to spend more time on? You know, if, if I'm an outside linebacker with, with Coach Smith, I'm, gonna, I'm rushing the passer most of the time. I'm going to spend a lot of my time working on pass rush as opposed to uh, dropping into coverage. Just looking at those percentages. So each position kind of gets percentages of how much technique they're playing. And, and I think that's important for us to have an understanding and take an inventory of how we teach those those techniques, especially the most popular ones. What drills do we use for? Um, but it, as, as I've said, it's it's given us an opportunity to kind of get get back to basics, take everything apart, and put it all back together. All right. Final question, Aaron Nagler. Coach, I was wondering, looking at your personnel usage, especially last year, you played a ton of dime. And I know the standard coach answer here will be that it's a combination of factors, but is that a reaction, if you had to choose one, to a personal preference that you have for playing that many defensive backs, or is it a reaction to what the personnel group has given you? Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a combination of both. Uh, a lot of it is I'm, I'm a big believer in and have always, always felt this way uh, ever since I got into coaching. Uh, you, you find ways to get your, your best 11 on the field. And, and I, I don't want to be cookie cutter in an approach of saying, well, we have to be uh, 3D linemen, two outside backers, two inside backers, and, and, and four DBs. We, we, want to be, we want to be as effective as we can. We want to maximize our chances for a successful play. So uh, I know we, we've played a lot of dime the last two years, and, and, and that's been a function of a lot of things. Certainly what, what our opponents uh, have done uh, part of it too was was some of the issues, that, some of the injuries we've had in in the uh, in the lack of depth we've had in the inside backer room. Uh, so you you'd like to find that. I mean, in an ideal world, I think you find that guy that that is that truly can do that can do both. That can that can be more than physical enough and have good instincts in the run game, but at the same time, be solid in coverage, can cover tight end, can cover back. What the safety, what the additional safety helps you with. Is now you can get a, you can get a lot more creative from a coverage standpoint. Now with three safeties on the field, you can rotate those jobs and now take a guy who is normally your free or your strong and put them down there. And it just makes it harder on an offense from an identification standpoint, where it's not as clear cut for them. Hey, they got four D linemen, two true linebackers, they got a they got a nickel corner and, and a four spoke secondary. Now it's wait a minute, there's an extra DB. How are we counting him? And then what does it do to them when now all of a sudden he's deep and now another guy who is deep now comes up and basically takes his job. It's something that's easy for us to do, uh, but makes it difficult on them. So that, that's one of the advantages of, of playing it as much time uh, as, we, as we have. 
and I've had to say the two, you know, the two reasons where, where I've, I've already hit is, is that the increased flexibility, uh, it's, it's better. I mean, leaning towards pass coverage. And then even the third thing, as I talked about too, just kind of the lack of just the, just kind of what we had available from a, from a depth standpoint uh, and who we could get on the field.